this is the Ruben Report. We are live streaming on Rumble, YouTube, and locals. Share, subscribe, tap the notification bell on this April 19th in the year 2024 for reasons I cannot get into at the moment. We do not have a post-game show for you today. I will explain further to the locals community perhaps this weekend. Uh, the theme of today's show is uh, is a catch-up. It's a Friday, so it's a catch-up on some of the stories that I didn't quite get to earlier in the week. We've got some wackiness out of the view. Surprise, surprise. Uh, the big story of the week that we did not get to on the show uh, was that the new head of NPR, and I suspect it's going to be a very short tenure over there, turns out to be a total wackadoodle leftist woke nutbag. Surprise, surprise. Uh, and they're starting, to, uh, they're starting to leak some video of some of the crazy things she has said over the years. We'll end with some crazy immigration stuff at the border, and then we will get to a rubenreport.locals.com community Q&A. So since we're just catching up on the week that was, why don't we dive right into it? Over on The View, they had to run cover. This story just sh kind of shows you how kind of crazy everything is because it's, it's such a nothing burger that they make into a something burger. So Travis Kelsey, you guys know Travis Kelsey. He is the tight end for the Super Bowl winning Kansas City Chiefs. And what you probably really know about him is that he's banging Taylor Swift. And... <laughs> Right, I think people know that, right? I mean, it's a thing, it's a thing. And I, I assume they're, that that's what they're doing behind closed doors or whatever, okay. Uh, well, he apparently liked a post that Donald Trump was in from Sage Steele. Sage Steele, who of course was on the Ruben Report last week, great gal, former ESPN anchor. He liked a post of Sage's that had Donald Trump in it and then the internet started going crazy. People were very upset, how could he do this? It's an affront to our Lord and Savior, Taylor Swift, et cetera, et cetera. So then The View goes out there to run cover, to explain why it must have been some, si some sort of mistake and or accident. NFL star and Taylor Swift's gentleman caller, Travis Kelsey, uh, just sparked a lot of uh, outrage online, apparently, after he liked a social media post that featured multiple photos of you know who. Now, some are claiming he's outed himself as MAGA and, you know, and it's, you know, I, my understanding was he was uh, responding to his friends, a friend of his post. So I don't, I'm not oh, sure what's friend? going on. I don't, I don't know them, oh. so I don't know which one. But a friend of a, his, yeah. It was a yeah. post by Sage Steele that he liked, but yeah. I, so, MAGA tends to do this. They really want to like find celebrities who are with them. And I hate to break the news to them. He's advocated for stricter gun control. He yeah. was literally the face of the COVID vaccine telling people to get the vaccine. A good thing, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. He kneeled during the national anthem. Like, I don't think you just, you know, sniffed him out as a secret Trump supporter. Yeah. But no, I also am not. someone who lives in fear of accident. Like, I scroll and I've liked things and then been like, oh, no, no, go back and unlike it. Like, that That's is my very theory. real. I've done it many times. Yeah. And on X, Elon makes it a lot harder to unretweet something yeah. after you, you do. You know, I just That's found a picture on my photo thing mm -hmm. of, 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 of the, um, what do you call that, the, um, the the party that they have for con for the press every year. The White House oh, the White House Correspondents Dinner. That's it. I was at the Correspondents Dinner, and I posed with Lara Trump and, and Eric Trump. I had a, I saw the picture, and I thought, I have to go into rehab now. <laughs> you guys, I hate it. I that we feel. live in. This that is you. before he became president. It was the correspondence, you know. Yeah, but Obama regardless, this is charge. to me like <laughs> I do not that when I like people, whether it's on a like or my friends and family, that is not an endorsement of everything they've said, yes. everything they've yeah. done, everything. Typically, when you're posing for a picture or you're doing something, let's let that go back to the good old days when that's all it was. Because I hate this cancel by association. If you've had a picture in your 45-year-old life with someone that said this and that, then you're an awful human being. That is not humanity. That's not what we learn from our parents. It's not what we learn from church. But this is I, a crazy a time we're living in. First off, believe it or not, I want to give credit where credit is due. Sarah Haynes, that's her name. My mom always says, David, my mom calls me David. She always says, David, you always call her the blonde on The View. You've got to start using her name. Sarah Haynes over there is making some sense. We are all too judgmental when it comes to all of these things and everything else. The I, first off, Connor said something to this effect while we were watching that. It's like, it's like, it's basically just like grandmas who have no idea what they're talking about, just talking. That's what the show could be called. Grandmas that are slightly out of touch. 
Whoopi's presenting the segment. She's not really sure what she's referencing. Joy can't remember what she's talking about. It's just, it's just completely ridiculous. But for this idea that they have to run cover, like they have to, there, there's an outrage and we're all caught in this. And I hope I do a decent job of it. And I'm sure I don't at times. That there's outrage, there's the fringe things of the internet. We feel we have to cover them. We have to expose some of the nonsense, all of those things. And they're running cover to make sure that the, <laughs> that the boyfriend, the guy who is banging, uh, what's her name? Hey, Taylor Swift. <laughs> That, that she, I, you see what they do, they break brains. Even trying to analyze this, my brain has been broken by this thing. Um, he's probably not a Trump supporter, but he is an athlete and he follows Sage Steele and he probably just looked and it's actually kind of cool. You know, if I had a friend, if I had a friend who took a picture with Joe Biden, I'd want to ask them like what it was like and did he mumble everything through? Did he know where he was and everything else? But I might like the picture and that would not be an endorsement of Joe Biden. Anyway, we've got just a tiny bit more on this, I promise. I think that this was an accidental like, you know, and everybody's been up late at night scrolling. I tend to purchase items off of Instagram late at night, but I think he may have been, you know, scrolling. Uh, Sage Steele uh, was a, an important sports reporter on ESPN. They probably met through ESPN and then he was like, oh, look at Sage. And then all the articles came out <laughs> and now he has unliked it because he was like, Oh, wait. Oh, he's still liking it. But okay, well, that doesn't matter, yeah. uh, to my point. I think it was just an accidental either like or he's just oh, supporting but I his did, I did. So actually, the reason I wanted to show you that one is Sunny, who, I, you know, I, what I think of her, she's just absolutely terrible. She's probably right that he was just scrolling, saw something from his friend Sage, you just click like on things, and you might be going, Dave, that wasn't the most heavy story you've ever done. And you would be right, but the reason I wanted to do it was I wanted to connect to how the cancellation machine is still operating in strange ways. So you probably heard of the story of this new uh, chief, this new president of NPR, and she is just this really out there lefty wackadoodle. And the only reason this even got exposed is because of an NPR editor and whistleblower by the name of Uri Berliner. So I've got some info here from Colin Rugg. Just in, NPR editor and whistleblower Yuri Berliner has resigned from NPR, blasts their new CEO, Catherine Marr, on his way out. Berliner was serving a five-day suspension after calling out the extreme liberal bias at NPR. I am resigning from NPR, a great American institution where I've worked for 25 years. I don't support calls to defund NPR, Berliner said. I respect the integrity of my colleagues and wish for NPR to thrive and do important journalism. But I cannot work in a newsroom where I am disparaged by a new CEO whose divisive views confirm the very problems at NPR I cited in my free press essay. So interestingly, he went forward with his whistleblowing about her radical past, and we'll get to that in just a second, the new head of NPR, via the free press. The free press is Barry Weiss's new online publication, or it's not that new, about two-year-old online publication, and Barry Weiss, interestingly, left the New York Times for the very same reason. She was sort of an old school, moderate liberal for the most part, who saw what was going on for the years before at the New York Times, how radically left it had become, how it had become, had become advocacy, mostly for the Democrat Party and the deep state, rather than actually doing real journalism, right? And he's seeing the exact same he thing here. Now, what's interesting about this is he's been at NPR for 25 years. I don't think NPR, I don't think the average person listening to NPR thinks it's anything other than, than left-wing news, right? I mean, even the left, it's only lefties that listen to it. And every now and again, I'll get in an Uber or something and listen to it for like 20 seconds. And it's absolute unbearable propaganda. So he knew what he was in at. Then she comes in, she's about to make it more extreme. And he actually said, okay, enough is enough. And he went public with it. So if you want some info on what's going on, oh, and I should say also, it's interesting that he didn't call for the defunding of NPR because of course NPR should be defunded. Why is the government in the business of funding news? Now, I know it's only a portion of their budget, but it just makes no sense. That's what we might call state-sponsored media if it was in other places, right? Canada has the CBC, the the government, so the taxpayer dollars are given to the government and the government then tells you what the accredited and authorized news is. That is a huge problem. So we shouldn't be funding NPR. Let's put that aside for a moment. Now a couple of videos of the radicalism over the years of Catherine Marr has come out. 
Uh, check this out from her a couple of years ago, talking about the number one challenge in her fight against disinformation. The number one challenge here that we we see and is, of course, the First Amendment in the United States pro, is a fairly robust um, right, uh, protection of rights. And and that is a protection of rights, both for platforms, which I actually think is very important that platforms have those rights to be able to regulate what kind of content they want on their sites. But it also means that it, it is a little bit tricky to really address some of the real challenges of where does bad information come from and sort of the influence peddlers who have made a real market economy around it. If you are viewing the First Amendment as a challenge, uh, you are on the wrong side of this issue, uh, especially because she's talking about platforms right there. So she's not talking about publishers. You guys know the difference between publishers and platforms. So. Uh, the Daily Wire is a publisher. They're responsible for what people say on their site, right? Twitter is a platform. Everyone gets to say what they want. And then if you break the laws of the United States, et cetera, et cetera, then you're in bigger trouble. You want the platforms to have the widest interpretation of free speech and you want the publisher to say, okay, I'm conservative leaning or I'm liberal leaning or whatever it might be. But she views, she fundamentally views, and this is just one of the, statements we're gonna show you, the First Amendment as a challenge to her work of fighting disinformation. And of course, what she means by disinformation is anything that runs counter to what she and most of the lefties believe. Anyway, Elon Musk saw that clip and I thought it was worth showing his retweet of it because not only did 26 million people see his retweet of it, which is crazy, uh, but I think he gets to the heart of it. This keeps getting crazier. The head of NPR hates the Constitution of the US. She views it as a challenge. And it's not just the Constitution she sees as a bit problematic. It's actually the truth itself. Part of the reason we have such glorious chronicles to the human experience and all forms of culture is because we acknowledge there are many different truths. And so in the spirit of that, I'm certain that the truth exists for you and probably for the person sitting next to you. But this may not be the same truth. This is because the truth of the matter is very often, for many people, what happens when we merge facts about the world with our beliefs about the world. So we all have different truths. They're based on things like where we come from, how we were raised, and how other people perceive us. No, everything you said was just completely backwards. There is one truth, and then we can all tell ourselves stories that are perhaps loosely based on the truth or have nothing to do with the truth or our disinformation, et cetera, et cetera. But the reason I'm doing this story is because whether you listen to NPR or not, or whether you think they're relevant or not, whether you think they should get government money or not, uh, th that these people still exist in society to some influential level is starting to become a problem when we cannot even say that there is just one thing that is true. Right, like there are facts that are actually true. There is historical records that are true. You can interpret them differently. You could have a political ideology that you apply to them differently and come to a different conclusion. But we only have one truth. It is as simple as that. I wanna show you one more from her uh, because she also is extremely concerned that Wikipedia is problematic because of, yes, you guessed it, white men. For all my love for Wikipedia, I'm not here to sell you on its perfection. I do view it as pretty flawed. It is mostly accurate, yes, but it can also be inaccurate and incomplete at times. More importantly, though, it's as biased as we all are. As a source built on other sources, it reflects the world that we have built, and its emissions reflect the worlds that we could have lived. Its policies of sourcing offer preference to European models of reference to the written word, excluding, for example, oral traditions. It is famously written by men, about 80% of its contributors, which means that there's so much missing from the other half of the human experience, not just the other half, the inclusivity, the entirety of the human experience. It's not just that women and other non-binary and non-gender conforming individuals are missing from who writes Wikipedia. It also means that they're missing from the history and the experience of how society has been shaped and formed. And of course, it has been written by the victors. All of the peoples and countries and cultures that have historically not dominated our understanding of world history are also missing in many ways from the written word. 
I'm very impressed that a woman who's so focused on, uh, what was it, oral traditions can put together so many words and say so little. It's just nonsense. Too many men are the editors at Wikipedia. It's the winners who write. It's all just drivel. And note, she is a middle-aged, I am fairly certain, fairly wealthy white woman. And it's odd to me that she doesn't step down immediately and bring in a black trans disabled lesbian to take over NPR. Wouldn't that... Like, stop saying this stuff, people. Show it, don't say it, right? That's that's what you're supposed to do there. Also, just because men write things doesn't mean they are untrue. A male historian is just as effective as a female historian, right? It, if their commitment is the commitment to the truth. So, and also there's reasons. It's The most interesting part of this is they want to rejigger everything in society. So no one is forced to write Wikipedia entries. If they have subsequently found out that it's 80% men, that tells you something about the mind of a man. It might tell you something about the mind of the man as it pertains to facts as opposed to feelings, right? That women are generally speaking better with feelings, men are generally better with facts or things. So then when it comes to a fact-checking apparatus, which was the which was the original goal, I think, of Wikipedia, it's turned into a whole bunch of nonsense, activist-driven drivel for the most part. But there might be an actual reason that more men, like there might be a fundamentally psychological and biological reason that more men are Wikipedia editors. So what is, what is it that you want to do? You want to force Wikipedia to have 50% men and 50% women, or I guess we have to throw in a couple percentage for men that think they're women and women that think they're men. And then do you think that having done that, right, by artificially reorganizing who should work there and who should be editors, that you will come out with anything more true on the other side, ugh, I told you I had one more of her, but I lied, because I guess I'm a man, and we edit Wikipedia, things like that. Now I have one more of her. The fact of the matter is, is that most written knowledge today has been written by white, colonial, European, North American men. And so one of the things that we're really focused on is how do we think about correcting the record? How do we think about writing people into history? How do we think about writing people into the present who haven't been represented in the same way? Knowledge, when we talk about knowledge for the whole world, it needs to be reflective of the whole world. And so one of the first things we do is we measure the gaps. Who is missing on Wikipedia? Women are missing, people of color are missing, people from the global south are missing, indigenous communities are missing, the history of Black Americans is missing from Wikipedia. Then we think about who's doing this work today and how can we support them? And it's not just about, say, for throwing money at the problem. It's also about going directly to these communities and saying, what do we need to change about ourselves? You know, what about the experience of editing Wikipedia? What about the culture of Wikipedia? What about the policies of Wikipedia need to change? Because in reality, the beautiful thing about Wikipedia is it is changeable all the time. It's edited right. 350 times a minute. So if we want to change it, that's fully within our power. So yes, we are cursed with a record that is hugely biased throughout history, but the power to change that, that agency lies with every single one of us who contribute to it. Good God, these clips just get worse and worse, right? It's like if she could, again, just get the color palette and the genital palette of the people doing this, and we need more people. Yes, if we had more people from the global South and indigenous people, None of that would have anything to do with making the truth more truthy. That's the problem. The truth is incontrovertible. You cannot change it. The truth exists or it doesn't. And basically what she's saying is if we could just bring in more of all of this, then we could, because she doesn't care about the truth. What she means is we could alter what people believe is reality for a political agenda. That really is what they're going for. And I will connect that with the one other story that I wanted to catch up on this week because we didn't do a ton on immigration this week because there was a whole bunch of other stuff going on. But when you talk about people that put ideology over truth, well, that's basically everyone in this current administration because for three years they told us there was no crisis at the border while seven million people walked in. Now they're saying there is a crisis at the border. They're kind of blaming Trump for it, even though he has no power right now. And uh, Alejandro Mayorkas, who of course is the Department of Homeland Security, uh, you know, the cabinet, the head of the Department of Homeland Security, uh, here he is uh, running cover for uh, the people that might, I don't know, cause a little terror in this country. Just listen to this. Tell me if you think his eyes are on the, on the right prize here. We've got Israel and Iran now in an open confrontation. I think a lot of people reasonably wonder whether what's happening overseas may become a threat to the yeah. homeland. Yes. Is there an increased risk 
in America of some sort of attack tied to sympathies in the Middle East. Yeah. We have seen an increase in anti-Semitism. We have seen an increase in Islamophobia following the October 7th terrorist attacks. There is no question, as Director Ray of the FBI and I have expressed publicly, we are in a heightened threat environment. And what we worry about is an increase in what we call domestic violent extremism, the radicalization of individuals already here, driven to violence, based on an ideology of hate. Credible threats right now as we speak? We have no known credible threats at this time, but we are in a heightened threat environment. What an absolute clown this man is. First off, we've seen an increase in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. First off, th there are protests everywhere calling for genocide of the Jews. It is not to say that no one out there is bigoted toward Muslims, but there is no mainstream chance and mass groups all over the place and shutting down bridges and airports and everything else uh, to, to say anything bad about Muslims. It's just not true. Also, Islamophobia, the phrase itself, it's really important not to use that phrase because it is a completely fabricated phrase. A phobia is an irrational fear. Uh, if you are a, a good liberal, if you are a gay person, you should have somewhat of a rational fear of Islam which wants to convert you. Not every Muslim person, uh, but an Islam, I have an irrational fear. I don't know, how, do you think if uh, somebody wants to kill you uh, and you're a little concerned about that, would you call that a irrational fear? Probably not. The word anti-Semitism, I think, has also been mucked. You could just call it Jew hatred, and clearly a certain segment of the people that Alejandro Mayorkas represents actually have that because it is the base of the Democrat Party right now. But the real purpose of that clip is that it clearly, if seven million people have come into this country, uh, some percentage of them probably have bad intentions, right? Have we learned anything after October 7th? But what they're mostly concerned about is homegrown domestic terrorism. And you know what that's code for. That obviously is code for white supremacists, right? It's gonna be the MAGA people were, were those domestic, they've been here. It's not the new people. And that isn't to say that none of them are bad or mean or might wanna do bad things. But all of us know, all of us know that the real threat, if there is a threat in the country right now as it pertains to terrorism, it obviously is coming from a group of people that we don't know exactly how they got here and what their intentions are. That is obvious, but what they, but it's a constant shell game with these people. You see reality and then they, they move it over here. All right, we got a Rumor Report community Q&A coming up in just a second, but let me talk to you guys about TWC Health real quick. Guys, the US government has collaborated with the Chinese scientists again on a project to aim at making certain strains of bird flu more infectious and more deadly. Does it sound familiar? So what do we think happens next? Someone gets infected with bird flu and now shockingly, scientists are saying that this particular bird flu strain could be, and I quote, a hundred times worse than COVID. So how long until force masks, force lockdowns, force vaccinations, and right in time for elections? Do you have what your family needs this time around? Anyone who's paying attention knows that the medical tyrants are far from done with us. But Americans are waking up and understanding that now more than ever, we need to have these life-saving medications on hand. They aren't just remedies, they're lifelines for the next time, which could be any day now if the scientists following this bird flu strain have anything to say about it. The wellness company's prescription medical emergency kit contains eight life-saving medications, including ivermectin, amoxicillin, z pack plus a guidebook to tell you exactly how and when to use them. You won't find anything like it in a store or pharmacy. Every American should have at least one of these kits in their home. Ordering your kit is simple and takes less than two minutes. Go to twc.health slash Ruben and use code Ruben to purchase your kit with $45 off and free shipping. For a cost of a single doctor's visit, all eight prescription medications will be shipped to your door. Whether it's bird flu, monkeypox, cyber attacks, or drug store shortages, you'll have what you need no matter what. 2024 is the year to be prepared. Safeguard your health today by going to twc dot health slash Ruben and use Ruben at checkout. Bonnie, rubenreport.locals.com community Q&A. Bonnie says, I love watching comedians. There's nothing better than a good belly laugh from a comedian talking about nonsense or politics or whatever the crazy world has to offer. My favorite lately is Tom Segura. He's so rude and not politically correct and I love it. I wonder how many new comics and probably all of you deal, oh, I wonder how new comics and probably all of you deal uh, when you bomb or have a heckler. In your days of stand-up, did you ever have a show where you bombed or had a heckler make you get frustrated? Did doing stand-up help you learn your skill for podcasting? As a comedian, did your ability to see the humor and the ridiculousness of, ridiculousness of politics help change your views? Um, 
Yes, 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 and yes. So first off, every comic bombs. It's how it works. The Jerry Seinfeld is bombed, George Carlin is bombed, Richard Pryor is bombed. It's part of it. Some You could have great weeks in a row where you're just hitting it and crushing over and over and over, you're killing, and then just out of nowhere, you just don't have it one night. Or the guy before you just rips the room apart, like kills, and then you're just not as sharp, so you feel like you're bombed. Sometimes the crowd is really raucous and you're not feeling it, whatever it might be. I never blamed the crowd, though, one of the things I always found with bad comics, they'd be like, how's the room tonight? You know, you bunch of comics at the bar, uh, uh, you know, as the show's going, how's the room tonight? Oh, they're a bad crowd, it's a bad crowd. They're really stiff, and it's like, no, no, no. If you're a good comic, you, you can figure it out. My style, to answer your question, was always, it's sort of what I do here when I'm talking to my guys off camera. I never really like just having like a super script, you know, very technical stand-up. I'm gonna get to this joke, this joke, this joke, that joke. Never did it. I would just get in the room and I'd be like, what's kind of on my mind tonight? So my sets were always kind of sloppy and a little bit inconsistent, but when they hit, they were absolutely crushing. And I very, like, I never got beat by a heckler ever because if you just, you have the mic, so you have the power. And if you know how to just play with people, um, you, you should not get beat by a heckler. I would see a lot of guys that were so stuck to their script that if a heckler got them, they couldn't get out of it, right? Because they were just, they only knew how to be funny if it was purely written in their head beforehand. So fortunately, I never i never had any of that. But that also, you know, one of the things that's changed in stand-up in the clubs over the last 20 years is that heckling used to be like a built-in part of the, it was built into the code. It was like, if you're a comic, you're gonna get heckled. And I always liked it because it broke something, it made something real happen in that room where now they kick hecklers out really quickly. And I, I've never found that to be great. It's like, it's a good part of the, the training experience. And yes, through doing all that, through talking to people, a lot of the rooms that I worked were in Times Square. So we'd have you know people from every corner of earth sitting there, not, not, not uh, native English speakers. And you had to make everybody laugh. You had to find out what was common there. And I think a lot of that did translate to how I do this show. Uh, we Can Save America 2024 says, do you think a militia to ensure the second amendment is not treaded on good thing? Or do you think the militia was created for other reasons? Because every grassroots group starts out as a good idea or good program always seems to turn into a tyranny monster. Well, of course, the Second Amendment, uh, which guarantees our right to bear arms, the technically what it says in the Second, second Amendment is a well-regulated militia being necessary to security, to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So that, of course, means that you yourself have the right to bear arms, and that was really thought of so you could keep a tyrannical state off your back and off your property and away from your family, uh, but that also we could have a militia so that if that tyrannical state ever became, say, too tyrannical, we'd be able to push back. Um, I would say directly to answer your question, it is a risk worth taking. It is not to say that some, some bad groups with some noxious ideas couldn't create militias and that could be a problem and they could be armed. Uh, but I'm less concerned about the offshoot group with some weird ideas than I am of a, of a government that has money and endless power and a military and much of the media in its pocket um, to ruin all of our lives. So look, I'm not part of a militia, but I do know that living in Florida and having guns here and just going on the assumption that most of my neighbors have guns, I mean, I talk to them, most of them do, like there's less chance that we're gonna have mass crime here. There's less chance we're gonna have some of the problems that we see in blue cities. It's one of the things, it's like, you know, you're living in a blue city right now, most of the blue cities. Chicago has like basically the strongest gun laws in the country and they still have the most shootings. So there is some connection there. If you see unarmed people, you might be more inclined, gun-free zone, it's a gun-free zone. Well, okay, bad guys don't care what the signs say, right? And, and you can have all the laws you want, but guess what, in Chicago every weekend when we read those stats to you and it's you know seven people killed, 50 people shot, most of those guns are bought illegally. So uh, yes, I'm a big defender of the Second Amendment. I would say that's one of the things that if I have shifted on things over the last years since waking up to a lot of this, that, that would be one of the ones. Uh, Amy says, what's the most terrifying scary movie you've ever seen and why? You know, I always say that my favorite, my favorite scary movie of all time, but it's more of a thriller than just a straight up scary or horror movie is Silence of the Lambs. That end scene when uh, Jodie Foster is in the basement with the, with the night vision on, oh no, the guy has the night vision on and you see her trying to figure out where he is and the girl who's been kidnapped down there and just, you know, he's, the, the whole thing with the whole concept of the movie that uh, the trans community would not be thrilled with this movie these days, but that he was basically skinning women so that he could 
put a woman's suit on. I mean, it's just so, it's such a deeply disturbing psychological thriller. The book, I've read the book also, which is, um, which is really, really, it's just even more gritty and intense and everything else. But in terms of scary, you know, Blair Witch Project was pretty freaking scary. The end of that thing. What else? What else? Wait, are you laughing at that one? You don't think that one's scary? What do you think scary? Uh, Insidious. Insidious. That's Brock's choice. I don't think I saw Insidious. Connor, um, what do you got? It, it, with the clown. Nobody, yeah, nobody likes a clown under the ground trying to grab you. Nobody likes that, yeah. yeah. Uh, Morgan says, uh, while I do sense a cultural shift happening that is moving away from insane wokeness, when do you think our institutions will catch up with the average fed up citizens, specifically our schools from elementary all the way up to college and beyond, who have fully adopted emphasizing multiculturalism and rejecting whiteness and like? Are we doomed to fight this for the next 20 years as our children move through the system and perpetuate these terrible ideas? Ugh. It's the million dollar question, right? Like, what do we do about the institutions? Are they all too uh, corroded and corrupted to save? Some of them probably not. Look, here in Florida, I know, I know we always talk about Florida, but I think it's worth talking about the good things. We've removed so much of the wokeness and the gender stuff and the race stuff from our schools that we will have some good institutions here and we'll have good colleges here. And you know, Florida, which you know, our elementary schools and our public schools were the joke of the country because it was where old people came and there was no tax dollars to, to fund schools. We now have basically the best schools. I mean, it's almost indisputable that we have the best schools in the nation. But I can tell you as a parent to two young sons, it's like, even now, even here in Florida, would I wanna send my kids to public schools? I'm not so sure of that. Like, you just don't know anymore. So when you see the deep corruption that we're seeing, I mean, this week we, we covered Columbia a ton. Like, why do you think that that place could be fixed? And even if it could be fixed, do you know how long it's gonna take to fix and, and what damage they could do in that process? You think Harvard's coming around anytime soon? Like these, unless you're firing everybody, but then what's the purpose of the institution? Is the institution just a set of buildings that you're just gonna bring in new people? Is that really what the institution is? Then, then does the name Harvard or Columbia mean anything? So I think most of them just have to fail. Like I don't see any reason uh, to, to send your kids to college at this point. I think there's value in college in terms of learning what it's like to live without your parents and living with friends and some of the socialization around that. And if you go to a school and really learn STEM things, and it's not to say that a liberal arts degree is worth nothing because it is good to know about other things. It actually is good to, to even take a course in jazz could be good. It's not gonna be the most functional thing in your life, but there is something nice to know about that and have a wide breadth of knowledge. But I, I am not, I, I don't think most of these things can be uh, saved. I think there will be new ways of learning. There will be new schools that pop up, new pods, homeschooling, school choice, et cetera, et cetera. Talway says, Dave, how do you and your partner resolve disputes when they come up? Is there a trick to keeping things together, especially when you're on the road so much. You know, I haven't been on the road as much since the kids have been born, so that's one thing. I'm, I'm around a little bit more. We're pretty damn good in all of our years. Like, we don't fight a ton. We see the world largely the same way. Um, you know, our energies are spent in different places for the most part. Like, so my energy is so much to, to doing the show and all of this political stuff and being in that fight. And David's energy is mostly focused on the kids. And then I have a few hours every day to, to be doing that together. Most of our frustrations are like, who's tired when, as it relates to taking care of the kids and, and like scheduling and things like that. And we don't have a ton of help and we're doing them as much as we can on our own. And these kids are, are great and happy and healthy and they're both like huge and strong and smiley and good. So uh, it's just about balancing that. We're trying to do date night once a month, like so that we could just go out, just the two of us, just to kind of get a little reset. So we finally did that last week. Um, I think the key truly is, um, and my brother told me this once, I think he got this from his wife's grandfather, uh, that the best advice was just don't go to bed angry. So if you're in like a little scuffle before bed, dinner's a little tense, whatever it might be, if you just kind of reset before you go to bed so that when you're, Lay, putting your head on the pillow, the last thing is not anger towards the person that you're in bed with or about the frustration, like we're gonna get past it. And I think that's part of it. Colorado says, Dave, I've been listening regularly for over two years, watching when I get a chance and engaging in the live chat. What I find that makes the Rubin Report stand out is how in contrast to mainstream media, you bring much needed humor, uh, much needed humor, uh, positivity, and most of all hope in the face of all the nuttiness in the West. That is even in contrast to some purported Christian and conservative programs I've listened to. Even admit, 
Even amidst some fundamental disagreements, the Rubin Report has been my number one pick on my drive home from work. Keep up the great show. I'm glad you're here, my dude. Well, thank you very much. That's not, that's not a question per se, but it's nice to hear. And look, I, there are a million people doing some version of news, right? What I'm trying to do is make it accessible to the most amount of people possible. I want you to, at the end, if you watch the hour long show every given day, first off, you've given me 50 minutes to an hour of your time. That's a lot of time if you gave that to me. And if you gave that to me five days a week, that's an awful lot of time. I wanna be respectful of that. The, the last thing that I would want is that you tune into this and you're just angrier after or you're stupider after. You watch MSNBC for an hour, I guarantee you will be stupider after. You watch CNN for an hour, you will be angry after. You will be angry not even because they were necessarily trying to make you angry, but you'll be angry because of all of the logical inconsistencies you see and all of that stuff. So when we do a show, when we wrap this show, if the guys say good job to me or that was funny today or I know it was funny or we had just a great run where I thought of something new or we showed a clip that I felt was particularly poignant as it related to something political, like, and I usually like when it's an old clip because then it's like, oh, it shows you old things have meaning. Um, then I know we've done something good. Um, but the nicest compliment I get when I'm out and about is, you know, Dave, your help keeping me sane. And, and if we can just do that, there's an awful lot of us and we just gotta find each other and uh, that's it. Bernita says, I'm a 74 year old lady from Ohio and I was shocked to hear from the great Katie Couric that I am jealous and fear the intellectual elite. This, you're, refer, you're referencing a clip we showed uh, of Katie Couric on Bill Maher's podcast Club Random a couple of days ago. What are your thoughts on her assessment of us as dumb conservatives? I'm wondering how long she would have lasted in my job as an aide to special needs children. Probably not that long. You know, I, I only watched a few minutes uh, beyond the clip that we showed you of that. But you know, Katie Kirk, I don't have anything against her. I'd be happy to chat with her. But she struck me as very much like just a product of the machine. You know, the way she talked about Trump supporters, the way she talked about conservatives, the way she talked about people who don't like globalism, right? Like the idea that you would care more about America then you would care about the global idea of us all kind of thinking the same way. So there was a dismissiveness there. Uh, it, my guess is she probably got some pushback in the comments and maybe she would kind of wake up. So I don't want to go too all in on her, but thank you for the comment. Uh, CP says, hear the story about the Western country that is planning on providing halal mortgages, Canada. I guess we will be going Sharia soon. I did not hear that. I don't know exactly what a halal mortgage is. I assume it has something to do with no interest or something, which in theory could make sense, but you need money to make the system work, to incentivize people to do things and everything else, right? So I don't know enough about halal mortgages specifically, but Canada does seem like it largely is on the way to Sharia law. We've shown you videos of people out on the street, you know, these Hamas supporting jihadist people talking about how Canada will fall and will be a jihadist nation and they only need X amount of people, a certain percentage, to overtake Canada or overtake the UK or the rest of it. And it's like, where are the good people? And, and Canada is such an example of how a society falls because it, it has fallen so far. And I love Canadian people. I know we have a huge amount of Canadian viewers. I've always loved going to Canada, touring in Canada with Jordan was wonderful. Um, and But Canada, it's a large geographic place without that many people that was basically kind of left alone and now the war is coming to its shores, its land, and the, and the average Canadian that it was just kind of like, oh, I, I like Putin, like they, they don't know what to do with this, and, and that is a problem. And then you've got that guy with fancy socks, and he's no good. Uh, hey, he says, hey Dave, I love, I love Isabel's book and find it encouraging that she gets as much attention as she does, well-deserved as she is very insightful. However, while she has a lot of confidence in her demographic to save our country, I find this very doubtful given the state of our university programs. What do you think? So what you're referencing is that uh, Isabel, it's very much what her book is about and we talk about it all the time, that she really believes that Gen Z uh, is coming out as way more conservative and will hopefully be enough of the pushback that we've all been looking for. There is some data to prove that, that we are seeing now that Gen Z is more conservative because they see the kind of woke generation go completely crazy and now they're coming back. But it, it really is hard to say because 
because the transfer of power from generation to generation doesn't seem to be operating correctly, right? I talk about it all the time. The baby boomers have held on way too long. Hence, we have Donald Trump versus Joe Biden. It doesn't matter what you think about either one of them. I'm talking about a certain age of people. You've still got your Nancy Pelosi's out there. You've still got all, you know, we had, uh, what's her name, Diane Feinstein, who was like 90 something, and they knew she was completely incapacitated and she was still a member of the Senate. We have way too many of those people holding on. So the younger set, the Gen X set, and I'm right in the center of Gen X. I was born in 76, I'm 47 years old. It's people that are roughly my age and a little bit older, the Elon Musks, the Peter Thiels, that, that age set should be running the show right now. We have more skin in the game. We're gonna be around more for more of our decisions. We'll, we'll be literally alive for the outcome of those decisions. We will have children that will have to live through that. Where Unfortunately, because the boomers are not letting go, it has caused the Gen Xers to not take charge and that's kind of delaying everything behind. So I don't know. I suppose there's only one way we'll find out. Uh, Kyle says, Dave, did you see the final season of Curb Your Enthusiasm? And if so, what did you think? Ugh. So this is the final season, it just ended. I believe that there, it was the 12th season. The first 10 seasons are spectacular. Some of the seasons, the season where he owns the restaurant, some of these seasons are, are comedy perfection, episode after episode without a myth, like just absolute brilliance. The last two seasons, so, so season 11 last season and this season, season 11 was horrible. It's just not funny, it's like a parody of itself. It's as if they just putting the scripts through chat GPT. It's just not good anymore. And this last season, I'm only seven episodes in, I fell asleep in the last episode and I told David, don't even rewind it. Let's, we're just trying to get to the end now. I'm, I'm just trying to get there. You know, my, my friend who I loved, 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 the great Richard Lewis is in it. And he, he, he clearly was not well and they were putting him in it still because he just doesn't, he doesn't look great, but I still love seeing him. And there's little moments in each episode. I get one or two, you choke out one or two laughs. Yeah, your Connor's watching it too. It's like, you can get one or two laughs. But I, but I have heard that the finale, the final episode is good. So stay tuned, I'll try to get to it maybe over this weekend. Uh, Phil says, is there any way we can overcome political apathy in America? It seems that people only care when they are forced to confront the issues. Well, look, <laughs> you better start caring. I know you care if you watch this show, um, but we need more people to care because what the bad guys on either side are preying on is that a whole bunch of us will do absolutely nothing, right? We will just sit there and, and the bad ideas of one direction will come and the bad ideas of the other direction will come. And most of us that are busy and have families and have kids and you're taking your kids to sports and you're going to work and you're doing whatever you're doing, we're, we're living our lives. And in a weird way, the, the activist class is preying on that. They're preying on the fact that you're distracted with reality while they try to up, upend reality. And that, that is a very tough thing that societies have to grapple with. How do you, productive people are productive and doing good things and, and happier and more, they are more purposeful. And once you're on that path, you're less inclined to be looking around. How can I destroy everything? Can I burn everything down? That thing's wrong over there. I better destroy that. That asymmetry is, is a very tough thing to arbitrage. So until we can figure out how to do that, I mean, just get more people involved, get people to vote the right way, get, just get your neighbors to think about things, uh, meet your neighbors. I mean, that's a good one. Just meet some more of your neighbors and talk about some things because when the shit hits the fan, you're gonna wanna know the people around you. Uh, Terry says, any update on your tequila brand? Well, I will be going to Mexico. We're going in about two, two or three weeks. My main, uh, my main tequila guy, Brendan, and Connor and I are gonna go down to Mexico. We're gonna taste some, some of the tequilas that we've been working on. Uh, we're, we've got some new ideas and some branding things. I don't wanna give you too much just yet. I will report back to you on this one when we return from Mexico. And we'll, we're gonna, Connor's coming so we can tape some stuff, so hang tight on that. Uh, but I'm so, I'm incredibly excited about this. Uh, Loves to Laugh says, would you be willing to encourage a unified conservative front by refusing to criticize former President Trump on your show. The liberal media has that covered, so it's up to us conservatives to remind the electorate of that of the specific things that he did that improved our quality of life. Well, I'm not willing to just say I'm not gonna criticize him. I think, I think post DeSantis dropping out, I think I've made my feelings very clear about this. I have no problem at the same time uh, sitting down with an RFK because I think he's worth listening to, of course. There's every reason that I'm obviously gonna vote for Donald Trump over Joe Biden and it's not even, it's not even close. These things aren't even on the same 
playing field, uh, but I don't think anyone should be above criticism. You're, you're completely right. The media has shown what it's going to do to Trump, but I think the only way Trump gets better, and, and it's not even just gets better, the only way Trump gets some new voters is if he feels a little pressure from his own people. He's a populist, so he actually responds to people, and that actually can be used to our advantage. So when he's worthy of criticism, I think, I think I have to do it. I, I don't think I could see a clip where he says something completely insane or is just completely off the mark. And then I was like, ah, I shouldn't do that because too many other people are gonna be criticizing him. Like, I, I, don't, I just don't think that would be the right way to do it. I think I have to call balls and strikes as I see them without, without irreparably harming the guy. Like, I don't have to go out of my way to find every clip of him saying something silly. We've already been through all of that. Um, but yeah, I think there are better ways to get everyone on our side. The better ways to get everyone on our side are showing people reality. You know, we showed a clip um, earlier this week of Donald Trump at the uh, UN, you know, the annual UN summit that they do every year, um, the General Assembly. And it was like Trump at his best. And I love showing those clips because as we watch the globalists try to take over the borders and all of the things that they're doing, it was a great clip of Trump like four years ago saying, this is what the globalist plan is and this is what they're doing with immigration and you should care about your country and there's reasons to care about it. So when I can go back to the archives and find the good stuff of him yesterday and then find the good stuff of him today, that, that really is the best way to do it. Uh, JC says, I wonder if anyone has had the thought that the reason for all the mechanical mishaps with Boeing is intentional. Could it be that Klaus Schwab and his WEF tribes way of making everyone terrified of flying so that we'll be content to just stay within our 15 minute cities. Not to mention the amount of fuel that will be eliminated from the atmosphere, which would be a benefit to their climate change agenda. Just some thoughts I keep having. Look, I, you know, I don't know, is that a conspiracy theory more than anything else? You could connect that to diversity, equity, and inclusion. All of these airliners, you can literally, I took a picture of it. I think I posted it in Locals a couple months ago of one, I forget, was it United? Do you guys remember? I think it was American Airlines, if I'm not mistaken. Uh -huh they had like some stickers on the plane as you're boarding. And one of them was like their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it's like, all right, well, are you hiring the best engineers or are you hiring people based on the color of their skin and their genitals? Because if you're doing that, then you're not hiring the best engineers. And then that might be why the door is flying off the plane. So there's a whole series of these things. Could it be at some level that the globalists want more problems with planes so the, uh, we will fly less while they fly private. Like, is that the craziest thing I've ever heard? Of course not, of course not. And then you combine it with diversity, equity, inclusion, which just destroys rather than building up, right? It's gonna just subsequently, they want everything, everyone to be equal. They will just make everyone equally less. They'll still be up here, but the rest of us will be down here and they'll be flying and we will not be. But not if anything to say about it, I am. It's Yoda once. Uh, Shelly says, why do you think the other governors don't just follow Florida's lead in what they do? We know Florida's doing awesome. Why won't the Republican governors at least do what we are doing? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, I think it's happening in some of the red states. I think Arkansas is doing a little bit more now. We're seeing more out of Iowa as it relates to school choice at Sarah Huckabee Sanders in Arkansas, of course, uh, Kim Reynolds in Iowa. We're seeing good stuff out of South Dakota. We're seeing in, in Texas, right? We're seeing Greg Abbott stand up against the federal government. So more and more of it's happening. Uh, but I think this week was a real bellwether for DeSantis uh, and, and for really every mayor in Florida, which is as these crazy Hamas jihadists try to close down our roads, it was dealt with immediately. And if you remember the show, I think it was on Tuesday. That's the day it happened. And I said, I guarantee, no, no, the day before it happened here, I said, if this stuff, because we were showing them closing the Golden Gate Bridge and showing, uh, showing you them closing the roads outside of the SeaTac Airport in Seattle, I said, if this happens in Florida, I guarantee you there will be arrests. And then lo and behold, 24 hours later, happened in Florida and we showed you the video of immediately arresting these people. I had Mayor Suarez here from uh, Miami. We're gonna air it in about a week or so. And he, we went through it. I said, what are the policies of Miami as the city of Miami, as it relates to these protests and closing roads. He's, he, like the way he even responded, you'll see, it was just so perfect. He's like, well, you can't close roads. You, you can't stop ambulances from driving down the street. You can't, you can't close public spaces. You just can't do that. Um, so we're a state of law and order. And yes, so your question is, why isn't that replicated more? Um, culturally, the woke, and, and these crazy leftists and the media and the Democrats, they're in it together. They have people confused about what the actual issues are. 
but really it gets to one of the previous questions. Most good people don't do much of anything. So people don't know what to do, right? And I'm very sympathetic to that. Imagine you're driving to work, trying to get over a bridge. The bridge is stopped by a couple dozen of these crazy people. You don't know what to do. You were just trying to get to work or you were trying to visit your mom or you're trying to take your kids to school. You don't know what to do. Do you wanna get out of your car and get into a fight with one of these people and then have your face plastered all over the internet and now you're told you're a racist and you're a genocide supporter and blah, blah. So good people don't know what to do. That's why I thought Tom Cotton from Arkansas Senator, his tweet was so interesting because he basically said good people have to take matters into their own hands. So you, you could interpret that as you wish. I don't think he wants people to break the law but like if you're that front car and they block you, now you're the front guy. So you gotta, you know, the front, let's say it's three lanes. If you're one of those front three, the move's on you. And should you be allowed to inch up and inch up and inch up and inch up until they move? I think you should be able to. And now what happens if you hit them now? Now you hit them and you break someone's arm. Like until we start dealing with these issues seriously, they are going to keep moving on all of us. It's their plan. Uh, guys, as I said, no post-game show today. Hope everybody has a spectacular weekend. I hope you get out there, get some sunshine or some air, play with the kids, do something with your family, eat some good food, listen to some good music, all of that stuff. We leave you with one of the great sitcoms of all time, Orphea. Uh, You, sir, were we having fun tonight? Having a great time. Oh, good. Thanks, good. yeah. Where were you on September 11th? No, gosh. No, Whoa. no, stop, stop.